Seeking Daylight Part 1, Journey to the Underhill Gates. Narrated by Million Quinteros. Chapter 2, One Man's Trash. If you happen to know the shortcut through the brush behind Old St. Michael's Church as Lewis did, it was just a short 10-minute stroll down Pebble Hill from the Academy to Grandpa Andy's house. 18 Beach Street. Why it was called Beach Street, Lewis could never quite figure. No ocean, lake, or even swimming hole could be found there. Certainly not a white sand beach. Instead, the short, dead-end stub of a road jutted from Flower Lane, lined with its winter barren red maples. The home was nestled back off of the street some, nearly hidden completely by the disorderly collection of now leafless shrubbery and fruit trees Grandpa Andy called his European Garden. Lewis wasn't quite sure what that meant. It always just looked like an untrimmed mess to him. In the spring, the small cottage home all but disappeared into the berry patches and other miscellaneous overgrowth. The exterior walls of the house were a tan plaster, with the wooden beams that supported the home exposed both on the inside of the home and out. Upstairs was a washroom and two small bedrooms, one of which was Grandpa's, the other a study when Lewis wasn't staying there. The main floor of the small home was just one simple room, but could be used any way you liked. Sometimes it was a library, other times it was a parlor where cards were played, but most times it was simply a cozy place where you could have a conversation. At this particular moment, it was being used for supper, and so a small, round wooden table and two mismatched chairs had been pulled to its middle, centered on the room's only piece of carpeting. As Lewis sat down, he noticed steam beginning to exit the kettle spout, first making a mutatone and then quickly letting out a scream. Startled, Grandpa Andy rushed from his seat to silence it, lifting the pot from the stove by its handle. Sugar? Grandpa asked as he reached for two small cups, leaving the saucers behind. Yes, please, and a little milk too, Lewis answered. Grandpa Andy opened the old stocky refrigerator behind him, retrieving the milk and giving it a sniff to check that it hadn't spoiled. He poured a touch into Lewis's cup, none in his own, and set them on the table. He sat and rocked backward in his chair, inspecting Lewis as he took a sip from the steaming cup and smiled before speaking. Did I ever tell you about the time your father broke his arm? No. The mere mention of his father stole the smile from Lewis's face just as quickly as it had arrived. The front legs of Grandpa's chair returned to the floor as he rested his elbows on the table in front of him and looked directly at Lewis, tapping his index finger sharply on the table. Did it right here. Leaning back in this very chair, I think. Leg slipped out from under him, and he broke his arm right in two, trying to catch himself from falling. Grandpa Andy pointed at his forearm, midway between his elbow and wrist, to a spot where Lewis assumed his father's arm must have broken. Uh-huh. Lewis replied, making certain to sound very much unimpressed, hoping Grandpa Andy would get the clue to change the subject. Anyhow, we didn't know how he had done it for almost a whole month. He made splints from some wood he found around the house and wrapped it up all himself. Never even noticed it under his shirt. Lewis looked up from the table, taking another sip from his cup as Grandpa continued. That's just how Tommy was. Didn't want a lick of help from anyone, no matter what. Didn't need any, if I'm speaking truthfully. I don't understand, Lewis finally piped up. Well, see, when we finally realized what he'd done... Your grandma, rest her soul, and I got him right to Doc, of course. Turned out the bone healed up just fine. That's what Doc said. It kind of reminds me of that time you nearly got knocked senseless playing, what do you call it, tackle the dummy? Yeah, I was the dummy, Lewis replied, embarrassed at the mere mention of the incident. Ha, maybe so, but you were determined to get back out there and tackle someone else, by God. Didn't want anyone to tell you otherwise. That there is something your old man might have done when he was a boy. The comparison irritated Lewis. After all, he considered himself to be polite, measured, and thoughtful. The things his mother had instilled in him back home growing up. Not the type of person who would act foolishly like his father had. Lewis said nothing. He didn't need to speak for Grandpa Andy to see what was on his mind. You know, you're a lot more like your father than you let yourself believe, kiddo. Grandpa Andy said quietly. Lewis stared down at the table in front of him. His face felt hot, like it may have been turning red. 
He kept his head down so his grandpa wouldn't notice he had lost his cool. He said nothing, trying to hide in plain sight right there at the kitchen table and getting angrier by the second. Why would he ever want to follow in the footsteps of a man who he had never met? Who, despite the fact, was the reason for much of the ridicule he faced every day of his life? Who, by all accounts, had become a downright loon? Grandpa Andy apparently realized Lewis had suffered long enough and interjected with a decidedly more serious tone. Your father. He wasn't crazy, you know. I know more than you think, Lewis replied defiantly, his eyes never leaving the table. Well, then perhaps you can explain a few things to me if you got it all figured out, Grandpa snapped back sternly, causing Lewis to take notice. Now, I don't know exactly what happened to your father during those years he went missing, back when he was a boy. Your grandmother and I, we didn't push him to talk that much about it, not unless he wanted to. But I've seen enough to know that he wasn't crazy. Not the way I figure it. I don't know, I overheard Ma talking about some of the things he used to say to her before I was born. She's even told me some of it. Things about what? Lewis hesitated before he continued. Dad had to say about where he'd been off to. Things he'd seen or whatever. It all sounded pretty crazy to me. I suppose that I can't disagree with you there, not altogether. Your father did say some things that none of us could wrap our heads around that didn't make much sense. Not if you were looking at him with our eyes. It's true, he told your mother some things too, when you were on the way to be born, about what had happened to him when he was about your age. To her credit, those were things hard for anyone to believe. The types of things that would make just about anyone think that you might need to go somewhere and rest your mind for a while. If you were to ask me, I think that's exactly where your father ran to. But why just leave Ma and me like that? Not even a letter. Lewis didn't want to admit it himself, but the thought had crossed his mind more than once that he may never meet his father. That he might have. He quickly pushed away the thought. I know it's hard enough to grow up a child in this world without having a father that no one can quite understand, kiddo. Grandpa's eyebrows turned upward sympathetically. I think your mother and father were both trying to protect you is all, in their own separate ways. Well, don't you think he went right off the deep end? Lewis said, challenging his grandpa using a rather instigating tone. Grandpa Andy leaned forward again in his chair, its two back legs rising from the floor as he looked Lewis straight in the eyes. Your mother told me bits and pieces of the story. Filled some gaps where your dad left them when he had told me or your grandmother about when he disappeared as a boy. There were things no one could have ever possibly seen. Not that I've heard of anyways. I wanted to believe. I really did. Your father was, is, my son after all. But no matter how I've tried and rearranged those things, she told me in my mind, it just never made any sense. Lewis slumped back into his chair defeated. That's it then. Not until that map arrived today anyhow. Grandpa Andy got up from his seat and motioned to Lewis to get up as well. Come on, I got some things I think you should see. Pushing aside both of the chairs, he slid the table just slightly off the small carpet, nearly knocking Lewis over in the process. He stooped down, rolling the carpet from one end until it was neatly to the side, and fished his fingers inside a knot in one of the floorboards. Finally, he grabbed and revealed a long piece of worn rope, pulling it upward until it snapped taut from beneath the floor. Watch yourself there, kiddo, he said, motioning for Lewis to take a step back. With a heave, Grandpa Andy pulled on the rope as hard as he could, lifting a large and hinged portion of the floor open like a door. He stepped out of its way, letting the hatch swing all the way open, slamming with a thud as it hit the ground and revealing a set of stairs that headed downward to a basement. He waved his hand as if to reveal the door to Lewis like a magician. Shall we then? Down the stairs they went, Lewis first, with Grandpa Andy following. The light shined down the stairwell from above, gradually dissipating until they stood on the basement floor in the complete darkness. Let's shed some light on the subject, Grandpa Andy said with his familiar chuckle. He rustled around looking for something, and the room was instantly filled with a glare from the one bare light bulb that hung at the room's center, blinding Lewis for a brief moment. His eyes finally adjusted to the light, and Lewis found himself in a room about half the size as the main floor above. It was cluttered yet strangely organized with shelves of different shapes and sizes encircling the room at its perimeter. They held old dusty books and stacks of rolled up paper, each neatly tied with string. Exactly in the center of the room was a small, square, standing height table where Grandpa Andy had begun stacking items pulled from the shelves behind him. 
He worked quickly, muttering something to himself under his breath that Lewis could not understand, and making his way around to the room's different shelves. Some of the items, hidden behind or underneath others, were quickly found, as if he knew where they'd been all along. Grandpa Andy began stacking the items onto the table as he retrieved them. A cloth backpack, a Zippo lighter, a wooden walking stick, a black moleskin notebook, a bunch of old stick candles, a small rotted piece of parchment, and the map they had looked at earlier that day. Finally, Grandpa Andy pulled a length of chain, like you might wear around your neck, from his pocket and set it on the table. At its end was a triangle-shaped, bronzed medallion. Lewis suspected he knew exactly where he had seen it before. Grandpa Andy unfurled the map and motioned for Lewis to press it against the tabletop at its edges. He placed the triangular medallion on top of where the carbon imprint of a similar shape had been made. It fits, said Lewis. What does it mean? I wish I had the answer for you, kiddo. Grandpa Andy inspected it closely to be sure it fit perfectly over the imprint on the map. These things were your father's. From the looks of it, I suspect that he may have had something to do with this map, too. In any event, it's all yours now. Thank you, I suppose, but what do you suggest that I do with this stuff? Lewis was trying to be polite towards his grandpa, as he suspected that he had meant it as a certain kind of gesture. The type where Lewis might, in some way, be able to feel a closer bond with a father he had never met, by being in possession of what appeared to him as little more than a pile of junk. A strange gesture, but Lewis suspected his grandpa's heart was in the right place. Not sure, really, said Grandpa Andy. Sometimes life gives you crap, I suppose. One man's trash is another man's treasure. One man's misfortune is another man's mission. And all that. I guess what you do with it is all for you to decide. This certainly appeared to be one man's trash. That much Lewis could agree with. At least most of it was. He certainly found the map interesting, and the medallion. Clearly it had sparked his grandpa's interest, and it was natural for Lewis to want to know more. He found himself wondering what his father might have been doing with these things. Why would he have had that map in the first place? Where exactly had it taken him? Before he could get too much deeper into thought, Grandpa Andy said, Hey kiddo, I'm parched. Can you run upstairs and grab your grandpa a cold root beer from the fridge? It was an odd request at that particular moment, but Lewis didn't think much of it. He ran up the stairs and stood in front of the refrigerator, door open, peering inside. I don't see any root beer, Lewis shouted in the direction of the stairway. There was no reply. He eventually found one anyhow, in the far back, behind the jar of pickles. As Lewis returned down the narrow stairway to the basement, he noticed the items that had been strewn on the tabletop had now been neatly packed away in the cloth backpack. Next to it was a note weighted on the table with what appeared to be one of the large brass keys from Grandpa Andy's keyring. But there was no sign of Grandpa Andy. Afraid that he might have fallen, or worse, Lewis rushed to the other side of the table, but there was no one there. Confused, Lewis turned, running back up the stairs. Grandpa Andy must have walked right past him when he had his head in the fridge. But no one was there. Maybe he went to get something from upstairs. He ran up the steps, taking two at a time, until he reached the second story, first looking in Grandpa Andy's room, and then past the open washroom door to the second bedroom. Still, there was no one. Where could he have left to in such a hurry? Lewis was utterly puzzled. He walked to the front door, opening it, only to see fresh-blown snow covering the walkway. No footprints led to the street. Now Lewis was baffled, and a little scared if he was being honest with himself. Growing more alarmed by the moment, he hastily returned to the basement, stowed the heavy key in his pocket, and picked up the note. Lewis, I don't imagine you will understand the motivations of an old man, as I have found myself having become. I also do not presume that you will forgive me for leaving so abruptly and without explanation. I can only promise that it was done with the best of intentions and your best interests at heart. I have made arrangements for you to continue your studies at the academy, and I know that you will make with it a life much fuller than I have ever done for myself. I only ask that you remember where you've come from as you endeavor on becoming who you will be. As for me, I have found myself an old man whose time for adventure, for finding answers, is quickly slipping away, and so I must leave you before my time has run out. As for you, what little I have left behind is yours to do with what you please. I sincerely wish that there was more I could offer you. 
I know that this is not how you would have ever imagined us parting ways, kiddo. But remember, sometimes life will present you with things that you are not quite sure what to do with. Perhaps they will lead to adventures of your own, if you so choose. But as always, I suppose that is for you to decide. Proudly yours, Grandpa Andy. Can't wait to find out what happens next? No problem. You can grab the first two complete books now for free by visiting pjowen.com forward slash free. 